Uh, thanks everyone for being here for today. We're going to go over two officer involved shootings, our two most recent for the department. One occurred on June 24th at 198th Street Northwest. The other one was on June 29th at 905 Louisiana Boulevard Northeast. Um, before uh, the matter gets started, we're going to have Chief Medina say a few words. So I want to thank everybody for being here today and uh, we're going to be reviewing two officer involved shootings and both of these officer involved shootings have some things that are similar uh, to one another. First of all, uh, there were officer involved shootings that occurred uh, in the public and where we had citizens uh, right in the middle of, of these incidents and uh, it is of a concern to us. Uh, second, uh, it's involving individuals that had uh, both drug histories, arrest histories, were repeat offenders in, in the system so to speak and they were individuals that we were dealing with to take into custody uh, a second time. Uh, one of them uh, was uh, extremely violent and had a history of assaulting others and, and they'll talk about uh, the fact that this individual had already stabbed a city bus driver previously in the past and had stabbed somebody who was trying to obtain help. While we're going to see that there's a concern for the citizens who were stuck in the middle of this, we're also going to see some acts of heroism from some of our officers as you see the video where one of our officers actually closes the distance and seems to be trying to cover the citizen that is below them uh, as uh, shots are being fired. And there's also other things that are concerning that we're going to have to take a look at in terms of uh, our tactics, how we deploy uh, deadly force, and ensure that we're doing everything we can uh, to correct or work on anything that we see as an issue. Last year we had 18 officer involved shootings and as we had those shootings towards the end of the year we had a review of all the 18 shootings and one of the criticisms that we heard from the community and I think it was actually the journal who brought it up at one point in time and said why did we take so long? Uh, we do listen to the community, we do take their advice and I thought that was a great question. Why did it take us so long? And since last year I announced that we would be doing this every six months. So when the six month period of, of the end of June uh, came uh, up I talked to Deputy Chief Lowe and I asked her for us to start doing a review of the previous six month shootings as we will do uh, every six months going forward as long as I'm Chief of Police. So we're going to be waiting for some results from that uh, to see what kind of recommendations they made. I know that uh, last year's recommendations, several of them were addressed and there are some things that we've made progress on and if there's any questions at the end, I think Deputy Chief Lowe could address where we're at in terms of that first initial uh, review. Um, as always, uh, we warn the public and remind them that uh, some of these videos can be graphic, they can be difficult to watch. And uh, we do this in an abundance of uh, transparency and uh, I do know that there are questions at times uh, referenced, especially the second shooting. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't in town and uh, we have made some changes and Gilbert's sent some stuff out to the media and how uh, media briefings will be handled in the future. So we hope that improves our communication and our ability to be transparent with the public and we'll continue to move forward and make adjustments and improve when we need to. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Deputy uh, Acting Commander uh, Carl Hartsock. Hi, my name is Commander Kyle Hartsock. I'm in the Investigations Bureau. We're going to cover two different uh, officer-involved shootings today. The first one was June 24th, 2023 at 198th Street Northwest here in Albuquerque. This critical incident community briefing will provide information about a male who pulled a gun and fired towards officers and the public as he ran from police, which resulted in an officer-involved shooting. You're about to see relevant video footage, hear 911 audio, look at photos and learn about other evidence and police procedures related to this case so you can have a better understanding of what occurred based on what we know right now. The APD conducts very thorough criminal and use of force investigations which typically require investigators to interview multiple witnesses, review hours of video footage and analyze a significant amount of forensic evidence. We're still at the early stages of this investigation which can often take several months to complete. Our understanding of the incident may change as this additional evidence co is collected, analyzed, and reviewed. We also do not draw any conclusions about whether the officers acted consistent with our policies and the law until the facts are known and the investigation is complete. There was four officers involved uh, and discharged their weapons in this first shooting. The first was Sergeant Giofranco DiPaolo. He's been with APD since April of 2015. He has no prior officer-involved shootings 
And he, like all the officers today at the time, were assigned to the Southwest Area Command. The second officer is Anthony Trujillo. He was hired in 2016, has no prior officer-involved shootings. The third officer was Officer Brandon Perez. He was hired in 2016. He has no prior officer-involved shootings. And Officer Damian Dudnow, who was hired in August of 2020 and has no prior officer-involved shootings. These officers are currently not back to full duty, but are expected to return soon. The person who was shot was 41-year-old Mark Edward Peter of Albuquerque. The incident took place in the Southwest Area Command near 98th Street in Central Northwest. The incident began when an employee at, actually it started at an auto zone. Uh, there's two shopping centers right across from one another. This incident started at the auto zone um, and ended up at the El Mesquite Market across the street. So as you watch the video, this will help you kind of know where you're, where you're looking. Call to police came in around 3.24 p.m. that day from someone at the auto zone in reference to a male subject, subject that was slumped over a steering wheel uh, with the vehicle running for over two hours. We're going to play you part of that call right now. Two hours. Um, yes, I have a vehicle in my parking lot. I run a automatic vehicle. I'm at the auto zone on 98, and I have a gentleman that's been slumped over in his vehicle for about two and a half hours. What's your address there? Uh, Officers were able to get information from the caller uh, and able to determine uh, the license plate of the vehicle. And upon their research, before they made contact with the subject or tried to, they found several similar calls to police involving this car and a male slumped out inside the vehicle. Uh, previous police calls when we contacted that car showed that a person by the name of Mark Peter, who was the registered owner of the vehicle, was also the subject found in the car um, and that he possibly had a felony warrant for his arrest. Another witness told officers as they arrived they had seen the male passed out inside the car and that he appeared to have a knife uh, in a shirt pocket or multiple knives somewhere on his shirt pocket uh, as he sat in his car. Um, officers did check and they did able to confirm that Mark Peter was the listed owner of the vehicle and at the time had multiple felony warrants out for his arrest. At around 3.44 p.m., the officers devised a plan uh, to give public announcements to the occupant of the car for him to exit the vehicle and come over to police. PAs were given um, until the vehicle with Mark Peter driving uh, started to drive away at about 4.08 p.m. In total, PAs were given for over 14 minutes before the car drove away from officers. Uh, officers had set up stop sticks in the parking lot. If you're not familiar with those, it's a technology that just allows, uh, if a car drives over it, it's gonna safely, slowly deflate the air from the tires, which makes the car harder to operate, especially at any kind of high speeds. The vehicle did drive over the stop sticks, but continued to leave out of the shopping center and cross the street to the other side where it parked in front of Family Choice Dental. Um, officers observed uh, the driver, Mark Peter, exit and start walking south towards the S El Mesquite Market. So if you look at where the dental office is, he walked behind those the shopping center towards the El Mesquite Market. So not through the parking lot, but on the back side of those stores. Um, the supervisor on scene was setting up a perimeter and was asking for less than lethal tools to come up. Uh, officers uh, gave commands to Peter to surrender and to stop walking. Um, he did not comply with any of these orders. He was verbally talking back to the officers, but he just did not stop uh, trying to get away from them. He comes around the corner and you'll see on the video, walks into the entrance of the supermarket. Uh, unbeknownst to the officers at that time, while they had seen a knife around his neck, like on a necklace, they did not know that he was armed. As he enters the shopping store, he starts to pull a gun from somewhere on his body and turn and produce it towards uh, the officers. Uh, one of the officers fires a taser at Peter before they realize that he has a gun on him. The taser actually connects with Mark Peter for approximately two seconds according to the taser log. Uh, during this time, Mark Peter, Mark Peter is still able to turn and fires a shot nearly hitting the officer in his torso or head 
that's firing the taser at him. Uh, at that point, that induces an officer-involved shooting where those four officers fire. Um, a second officer did deploy with a taser during the shooting that you'll see, uh, but the taser logs show it did not have a positive connection during this incident. Officers moved into positions that tried to limit any firing of their weapons towards the back of the store. As you'll see on the videos we show you, this store was very much populated and in use at the time. It's right near all the cash registers when they walk in. Um, and the, sh the shooting continues. Uh, at this point, we'll go in and start to show you the videos. This first one is showing Officer Perez uh, giving PA announcements to Mark Peter as he is still passed out in the car. We're just going to play a small sample of that. This next video is from Sergeant DiPaolo. You will see in this video, Mark Peter, uh, in the same vehicle he was in, uh, just pulls out and against the officer's commands, drives away, but you'll see him drive over the stop sticks and you can actually hear the air slowly leaving the tires as he drives away from officers. next video is from Officer Trujillo. Officer Trujillo is one of the first officers to confront Mr. Peter while on foot behind the shopping center. Uh, he is also armed with an AR rifle that he will fire during this incident, and he also is the officer that successfully tases Mr. Peter. Um, we're showing you this video first, although it doesn't give you the clearest picture of the shooting, but he's the first one to make contact with him. The other videos will give you a much clearer picture of how the shooting unfolds. Hey, right there, Albuquerque Police Department, stop! Stop right there, put your hands up! Albuquerque Police Department, stop! You're not free to leave, put your hands up! Stop right there! Put your hands up, stop! Stop, stop! You're not free to leave! You're not free to leave! Stop, put your hands up! He has a knife on him. Stop! Don't reach! You're not free to leave! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! You're not free to leave! Give me a 40! Get a 40! Fuck! Watch his hands! Don't let him go in! Don't let him go in! This is the video from Sergeant Apollo. Uh, again, this is after Mark Peter had driven away, parked, and fleeing on foot. And the video you just saw, that second officer you see start to come up, that's the sergeant. So right now we're going to show you his video. What? 
Get on the ground. Don't reach for anything. Get on the ground. Don't reach for anything. He's got knives. We're going southbound towards MSP defeating for super calm. Lock it down. Get on the ground now. You're not free to leave. Give me a 40. Give me a 40 up here. We're still going southbound. Watch his hands. Don't let him go in. Don't let him go in. Get out of there. Get on the ground now. He's got a dog. things to note on that video in the sergeant's interview he stated when the shooting started he purposely moved himself to that cashier station to the right to try to limit any of his shots going into the back of the store where customers were so that is why you see that real aggressive movement in there another part to point out is um, the offender's gun and we'll show you a close-up picture of it it's it's in, it's in lockback position which is what a firearm does when it's out of ammunition. And again, we'll have other video that shows him firing it. So the suspect fired the gun, we believe, all the way till it was out of ammunition during this incident. And this next video is from Officer Perez. He also attempts to use uh, a taser. Um, it appears to be ineffective. He transitions to a handgun and he does fire. Here's his video. And here's Officer Dude now, who does fire his weapon. This is a still photo from Officer Trujillo's video. This is the officer that tased Mr. Peter as they walked in. In the red circle, you can see the firearm that Mark Peter was in possession of during this incident and fired. Uh, in the yellow box, you can see the, the leads coming from the taser. Those are the wires going out and connecting with Mark Peter. And again, the taser reported a positive connection for approximately two seconds. Uh, but as the offender produced a gun, was still able to fire his gun while being tased, the officer gave up the taser and transitioned to a firearm. This is the surveillance video from the store. While there's no audio, this does show a very clear kind of bird's eye view of how this takes place. I'm going to play it one more time and, and point out two things. One, the offender as he's pulling the gun is back as to the officers, which we believe is why there's a delay in them understanding there's a, a gun involved. But you can see uh, Officer True actually move his head like this. When we match up the audio, that first shot Mr. Peter fires, we believe, goes right by the officer's head and you see him react to it while holding the taser. Second, you can see uh, the glass falling down. We believe that's from Mr. Peter's gun, which is now just firing kind of errantly up and around and it's hitting the ceiling and knocking debris down.
This is a still photo from that surveillance video you just saw in the red circle. Uh, this is one of the first moments, at least from the video's point of view, we can see the firearm being pulled out and manipulated by Mr. Peter as officers are trying to apprehend him. This is an overview photo outside the El Mesquite. Um, you can see our evidence markers marking casings, projectiles, and impacts from the, the two tasers that were used. A total of 59 casings were located on this scene. Um, 36 of them were um, nine millimeter uh, from handguns. 10 of them were 223 rounds from our AR rifle. And there were 12 other uh, different branded nine millimeter casings that we believe are all fired from the suspect's gun. So at this point in the investigation, we believe the suspect fired 12 times at us. There was another round uh, casing found that doesn't match any of the ammunition types of ours are his main and we're still determining if we think that came from his gun or if it just came from somewhere else. Um, this photograph just highlighting the two tasers that were utilized during the incident. They were thrown to the ground and remained on scene as the officers transitioned to their firearms. A total of 21 impacts were located inside the store. Um, they're from Mark Peter's weapon and officers. Uh, we also recovered 32 projectiles from inside the store. Uh, this is the firearm that Mark Peter had and it fired during this incident. It had not been reported stolen and we are still investigating its origins at this point. No knife and leads were tied to this gun at the time that we tested it of the shooting. A search warrant was conducted on his vehicle that he fled from officers in uh, we recovered another 9mm round, um, 45 caliber ammunition as well, uh, some cell phones and a BB airsoft gun. Uh, one interesting kind of uh, thing we found while investigating him uh, is in April of this year, the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department actually had a very similar run-in with Mark Peter uh, at, a, at a, a retail shopping center in the South Valley where he was passed out in a car. Um, in that instance, he also refused to exit the car, but finally did and was placed under arrest uh, peacefully when he surrendered. Uh, he also had a firearm and fentanyl drugs on him during that arrest. Um, he went to the hospital, I believe, that day, but the Sheriff's Department had issued a warrant for his arrest. That was one of the warrants he had at the time of this incident was for the Sheriff's Department contact with him. Again. Uh, the person that was shot was 41-year-old Mark Edward Peter, and he was pronounced deceased on scene. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go into the second shooting, and then we'll let you guys ask questions on both. The second shooting uh, happened June 29th, 2023 at 925 San Pedro Drive Northeast. This critical incident community briefing will provide information about a male who was attacking multiple victims with a knife, which resulted in an officer involved shooting. Just like the first one, a word of caution, the images and video may be disturbing. When police officers use force to arrest a subject or defend against an attack, it can be graphic and difficult to watch. In addition, there may be strong language by those shown in the video. Four officers discharged their weapons during this incident. Uh, the first officer, Eric Wilinski, has been with the department since 2014 and has no prior officer-involved shootings. And he and all the officers involved on this day were working with the Southeast Area Command. Officer Christian Cordova has been with the department since 2015. He has one prior officer-involved shooting. Officer Brenda Johnson has been with the department since 2018. She does not have any prior officer-involved shootings. And Officer Violeta Baca, uh, has been with the department since 2019, has no prior officer-involved shooting. At the time of today's press conference, these officers are not back to full duty yet, but we do expect them back soon. Person shot by police was 25-year-old Jeremiah uh, Salyards. The incident occurred in the Southeast Area Command. Um, on that date, around 9.24 p.m., officers were dispatched to 925 San Pedro, which is a McDonald's restaurant. A male victim reported to police that he was giving Jeremiah Salyards a ride and was giving, uh, buying him food from McDonald's. Um, and while sitting in the drive-thru, uh, the victim who was driving stated Jeremiah just said sorry and stabbed him in the neck. 
Jeremiah then fled the scene, uh, wearing a backpack and, and wearing all black clothes and armed with a multicolored knife. Uh, here's one of the 911 calls we received that initiated a police response. Call my mom, call my 911 emergency. Yes, um, hi, I'm, my name is Austin. I am at the McDonald's here on um, San Pedro and Lomas. And I was ordering my food when I got hit from behind. So apparently some gentleman was stabbed and he is bleeding right now in his vehicle. And we're in the drive through right now. Okay, so this is at Lomas McDonald's? Yes, Lomas and San Pedro. Is the person who stabbed him still there? Um, I don't know. Apparently this guy ran off. This is video of the victim getting stabbed from the McDonald's. You'll see the passenger door, passenger door open on the black vehicle on the bottom right, and uh, Jeremiah Salyards flee southbound. The victim had multiple stab wounds on his neck and face and was transported to the hospital in stable condition, and he survived. There's no audio on this video. Around 11.50 p.m., so about two hours later, while officers were still on scene at the stabbing, a witness uh, approached officers and stated that a male subject with a pink and orange backpack holding a knife uh, was at Lomas in Louisiana, just down the street. Uh, officers arrived on scene and began to give commands to that individual, uh, who they believed was the same subject who had stabbed the victim at McDonald's. Officers saw that subject, or Jeremiah Salyards, walking in the median of Louisiana and saw a knife in his hand. Officers told Jeremiah to drop the knife. Jeremiah did not comply and ran from the median of the street directly north uh, on Louisiana and then westbound towards a bus stop that had three individuals sitting at it. The three men who did not appear to know Jeremiah were sitting at the bus stop. Jeremiah raised the knife uh, in front of officers and while looking at the men, raised the knife. Uh, the men stood up, appeared to be in fear and started to walk away uh, or run away from Jeremiah. As Jeremiah got closer to the men, he appeared to be threatening them with the knife, which resulted in an officer involved shooting. During the officer shooting, two of the three victims that were at the bus stop um, were hit by police rounds. This is Officer Cordova's video. Uh, he does fire his weapon. Albuquerque, please stop! Drop the knife or you're gonna get shot! You're gonna get shot! Stop! You're gonna get shot! Stop it! Stop! Drop the knife! You're gonna get shot again! Drop it! Drop the knife! You're gonna get shot! Drop it! Drop the knife! Drop the knife! Drop the fucking knife! Drop the knife! Drop it! Drop the knife! Drop it! Drop the fucking knife! Drop it! This is the video from Officer Johnson, who does fire her weapon. Drop it! Drop it! Shot fired. Drop it! Drop it! Drop it! Drop it! Get shot! Drop it! Drop it! This is video from Officer Baca, who does fire her weapon. Hey, drop the knife! Drop the knife! Drop the knife! Drop the knife! Drop it! Drop the knife! Drop it! 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 Drop the knife! 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 Drop it! Drop the
fucking die. Drop it. Drop it. And this is Officer Walensky's video. Who does fire his weapon? Drop it! Drop the knife! Drop the knife! Drop it! Drop it! Drop the knife! You're gonna get shot! Two knives were located on scene. This first one had the blade closed. This is the second knife, which is multicolored as the initial victim described. The blood on this knife is currently being tested against DNA standards of that original victim at the McDonald's. Again, as we believe this was the knife that was used in that stabbing. During this incident, a total of 25 casings were recovered from the scene, all from police firearms. The subject, we believe, was hit at least seven times. We were only able to locate about two additional impacts that hit a fence behind where Jeremiah was um, at the bus stop. The person shot by police and who died at scene was 25-year-old Jeremiah Elijah Salyards. He had been arrested in 2020 for stabbing a city bus driver several times on the southwest part of town. He was kept in custody pending trial. He did actually have a trial in May of 2022 where a jury convicted him and a judge gave him a three-year prison sentence. He'd already been in custody about two years at that time, so he served an additional one year in prison and was just released on May 4th, 2023 and was currently at the beginning of a two-year parole term. On both cases, over the next several months, the police department will continue to investigate and analyze this incident. We'll continue interviewing any new witnesses that come forward and complete any forensic test. After the investigation is complete, a force review board will forward the findings to the superintendent of police reform to determine if these incidents met the high standards of the Albuquerque Police Department. The MATF will forward the case to the district attorney's office who will make any determination of criminal charges and will help answer any questions. Um, were any non-lethal methods employed with this second shooting on the Indiana bus stop? None were fired during that incident. Gotcha. Um, why not before the shooting commenced? With the first incident, we saw the taser being I'll let, I'll let Chief handle it. You know, I think if you look at the video, and of course those are questions that are going to come up, but when we're talking about less lethal, it's always was the feasibility and were we able to utilize less lethal given the situation. When you look at it, you could tell that, number one, this incident evolves very quickly. It goes from some officers walking on foot to two police cars passing them, and then it is a matter of seconds before you hear them giving the individual orders. And if you look at the video closely, you'll see the suspect actually touches one of the victims on the back. And I was concerned, and I even asked the question, did he stab him? Uh, because you could see that he clearly was already touching this individual. And, we will have to determine if it was feasible for them to utilize less lethal or if this uh, escalated so quickly that less lethal was not an option during this situation. What are the protocols for shooting a suspect like that when bystanders are so close? You know, we have four firearm rules that we are, that is ingrained in our mind during the academy. And every single officer knows those four rules. Uh, number one, all guns are always loaded. Uh, number two, do not let your muzzle cover anything you're not willing to destroy. Number three, be sure of your target and uh, what is beyond it. And when we talk about the last two in particular, those are questions that we're going to have to answer during the administrative investigation. It's like, what was in line? What were the officer's perceptions? What was going through their mind at that time? So we do have to answer some of those questions. And when the investigation comes out, we should have some answers as to what the officers are observing, why shots were fired, what, if, uh, what they saw, and, and why it was necessary at the moment with these individuals in line with them. Do you have any 
happened to what prompted the second round of shooting then that took place? As if you look at the video, you can see the individual is still within arm's reach of, of the victim that I talked about earlier where you can see he actually puts his hand on the right side of his back. You can see they're still within distance. The officers are still giving orders. You hear them asking, bring a 40 up. A 40 is less lethal. So the officers are asking for less lethal to get there. So we are happy that they were trying to transition to less lethal. The investigation will have to show and the officers will have to justify. But from the video, what I can see is that you can see the individual had turned back around, had gotten on all fours, and the officers are going to have to give their perception of what occurred and why they deployed deadly force again at that point. Um, how many times was each of the other two people shot, and what are their current conditions? Uh, Kyle, do you have specifics? I think one was shot. The, the main one that went down that was most injured, I believe, was four, and the other one was once in the knee. The one in the knee has been released, and the one with four is still in the hospital. Or is rehab in like an inpatient? Yeah, no. They're expected to survive. I think six wounds. Isn't that right? Yes, it's correct, and he's... Uh, at a waiting at the hospital to go to a, another. He's, okay. He's spoken to us. Yeah. Okay. He's, were those he's were those uh, men transients? Do you guys know if they were transients or if they were? I, I don't know Did, their sheltered status right now. Given the fact it's three in the morning, there's no bus service. I think it would be safe to say that the individuals may have have been uh, unhoused. Last year you mentioned there's 18 officer involved shootings. What's yes. the number right now? We are at seven? Seven. Seven. Officer involved speaking. Three fatal. Three fatal, you said? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, a follow up on bystanders. Uh, what is the protocol when people like that are injured? Do you guys pay for our hospital bills, or what is that kind of That is something that goes through city risk management, and city risk management will make determinations and work with them. One thing that I did talk to Commander Vega about is we wanted to make sure we got resources out to them immediately from the city. And uh, he assured me that resources were immediately provided in terms of uh, uh, giving them the support that they needed. Going back to the first shooting, does that count as well for the damage done in the <clears throat> Ines Heat market? Does that fall into that category? They, they would go through our, our risk management process and proceed. A lot of times, in general, a lot of times uh, we are, are going to end up paying for it as a city. Matt? Yeah. How did Salyers know the initial victim that he was in the car with? I don't have that information. The victim said he was wanted to help out a, a parent transient person by, he says he does this, he gives people lights, and gives them food, and that's all he was doing. Okay. Like he had just met him minutes or moments before the stabbing took place. And he's recovering in the hospital? He's, he was released. Oh, okay. Has OMI released any information to you guys about the toxicology reports for both suspects? No, but uh, one of the things that we did do is because I think it's important that we know the toxicology of individuals and we all know that somebody under the influence of narcotics or other drugs are, go are can sometimes can be uh, have different behavior than those that are not. So one of the things that we are doing now is we are making sure that uh, we do have uh, those toxicology reports eventually uh, uh, provided to us and it generally takes about six months, George six months but we recently did get some toxicology reports on other officer involved shootings and i think they showed all that almost everybody involved in those were under the influence of some kind of drug or alcohol we're gonna have a news conference oh, we'll have a news conference we'll talk about all this kind of like what we did at the end of last year at the end of the 18 we're kind of planning something like that in the near future to talk about these first seven of 2022 uh, yes matt with the lms ski market <laughs> one uh i'm sure you guys have analyzed it and i don't know if you guys have Douglas, it was kind of fast. Um, do you know if at any point officers were firing either in the direction of people or at each other? At one point, it's like one officer gets on the ground with a rifle and he's kind of firing this way, and there's another officer on this side. Has that been looked at all, and is that something you guys have come to? That's something they're going to be looking at. There's something that's going to be come out during the course of the investigation. From the video itself that I see myself, there were just people all over. And I think it's going to be very hard for us to say that there weren't citizens who were there. But also, it's one of those, if you look at it, you know, and the, the one word, if I could use one word to describe both scenes, uh, chaos. I mean, you could clearly tell that these incidents escalated rather qu extremely quickly. And all of a sudden, the urgency became the subjects going into the El Mesquite market. This subject is actively chasing these individuals armed with a knife. Officers had to make quick decisions, and it is very chaotic with the amount of individuals that 
are involved and the fact that they're taking into account the citizens who are in the general location of the subject that's armed with a firearm. How many rounds did Peter fire? I believe I was told four. Well, 12. 12. 12. 12. We feel confident that 12 could have been 13. Okay, but at least 12. At least 12. And I think it's important to note that Mr. Peter chose the location to pull the gun and fire at officers. Mm -hmm. Officers were actually trying to give them space and time to safely get taken into custody, and, and he chose that escalation path in a very crowded supermarket. Do you think this will bring about training that will look at this? Because I mean, I feel like I've been covering police shootings for a bit, and I haven't seen one necessarily that was kind of like both of these. And you think that's going to be kind of something you guys will look at for like training with like crowded? Yes, and that's something that right off the bat when these came up, myself and Deputy Chief Lowe spoke about. She's in charge of the academy. And I was that. We really want to get to the point where we're using incidents that happen with the Albuquerque Police Department to drive our reality-based training. And we're putting officers in the exact same scenario that their fellow officers have been in in the past. And we use that as a teaching point to see how we start carving out behavior. These are two, like I, you said it, Matt, like of all the years that I've been here, it's very not very frequently that we see that citizens have been so close to what's occurring and and in both of these situations the offender purposely went and to me in a lot of ways was using the public as a shield to try to get away from officers were there to your knowledge any bystanders hurt or struck in that first shooting at the market no, there were there were no injuries reported in the thing, but I think it's important that we also talk about that. Like there may be no physical injuries, but my heart goes out to all those employees because there has to be uh, psychological and mental uh, anguish that is occurring to these individuals because of what they have been exposed to. And I think it's important that we take a look as a community and we talk about this over and over again. And I'm telling you, both of these individuals, in my mind, are individuals that should not have been out in the community in the first place. You stab a city bus driver and you go to jail for three years. I just want that to sink in with the community. Like, I've said it. I've said it over and over again. Substance abusers should be getting substance abuse help. People with mental health concerns should be getting uh, mental health uh resources but when an individual crosses the line and becomes violent it is of the utmost importance if we're going to make this community safe that they are held accountable and that they're removed for the appropriate amount of time from the community these are just this is unacceptable that and, and we just seen it now in another part of the state where it's just this process of individuals not being held accountable costs human life or puts others in danger that city bus driver is he she okay I, th I think, yes, but he survived. Is he still a bus driver? I don't know. I don't know that. But. Uh, back to the second OIS, so I guess depending on whether it's a firearm or any lethal weapon like we saw with the knife there, is it standard to have multiple officers fire at someone? I guess no matter if it's a firearm or a knife? It, it, it is possible. And especially we have to remember that when we have incidents like this, we deploy a lot of officers. But one of the things we are looking at is one of the things that really stood out to me in these incidents is we have to look at how we're going to proceed with this because right now our policy says, you know, we got to give everybody orders. My biggest concern now is we now have eight, nine people yelling at one individual. And when these situations unfold this way, there is no guarantee that all those eight, nine people are going to have the same message at the right time. So I think we do have to look to see if there's changes we need to make to ensure that there is one clear order that is being given to individuals and we are looking at that that, that is something we have to work with all the parties in our court settlement agreement with to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we're meeting all of their needs but that is just one thing with these large groups that is very concerning to me and of course as we get these larger groups we're going to see larger amounts of shots fired because more officers are discharging their firearm and it's unclear if he was actively trying to stab that man or grab him or something it's not really yeah. clear what it is. It's it's very unclear. Like I said, you see him touch him on the back. It is it's it's so unclear, but unfortunately, you know, we've had the luxury of sitting here and reviewing four different videos, uh, but our officers are out there in real time and they are jumping out of a car and they're making an, an assessment and they're making a decision that they didn't have the luxury to sit back and look at this, sit, think about it and uh, make a decision based off of that. What we're evaluating is he has a knife in his hand, he is raising the knife above his shoulders and head, 
we believe he already was willing to use that to stab someone else, and every officer there knew that as they approached him. So there's a little bit more of that context to it. I have a question about the second rounds that were fired as well. Um, once he was already on the ground, um, again, I wasn't there during the moment watching after the fact, but would it be clear to say you could get closer to fire shots like that, or do you still think people are in danger um, firing so far away when he's already down? One of the things I noticed when you notice, you know, the first volley of, off, of shots being fired, obviously we know that some of the victims uh, were in line with the officers. As you proceed to the second round and you start to see, you start to see that the officers had better angles. So I, we do know that they were trying to find a better angle at that moment in time. Uh, and, and it's clear from the video that they were trying to. But also at the same time, those are some of the questions that will have to be asked. Was it feasible for us to go hands-on? Were there other options that could have happened? And those are all questions that will take time and uh, that we'll have to conduct the investigation and get statements from everybody to determine what was appropriate, what was not. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, everybody.